maybe some people will still join in. So uh, welcome everyone to the third day of the Bootstrap conference. So, uh, so it's a pleasure to have Mert Beskin. He will tell us about Birazoro conformal bootstrap with C greater than one. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks again for inviting me. It's exciting to be here. And uh, I'll talk about this work that you see uh, that appeared on the archive a few weeks ago. So uh, it's a bit funny to just give an intro to Bootstrap to this audience, but I'll do it nevertheless to set the stage. So conformal bootstrap, as everyone knows here, originated in the study of 2D CFTs um, following the work of Belovin, Polyakov, Zanologikov, and Polyakov using the infinite dimensional Virasoro symmetry, minimal models were discovered. Uh, this used special discrete features of C smaller than one, uh, central charge smaller than one, unitary representations of the Virasoro algebra. So basically presence, presence of null vectors uh, at these uh, specific values greatly simplifies correlators and the Virasoro blocks leading to closed form expressions for both. For C greater than one, unitarity says little. The only constraint due to, catch, to the catch determinant seems to be that the chiral dimensions or that their sum should be greater than zero. And uh, what doesn't help is Virasoro blocks are only known in expansions in terms of various forms of the cross ratio, except in certain limits, but for finite central charge, uh, they are not known in explicit form. So the question uh, I'm asking today is, can we use uh, the Verasoro blocks to restrict the OP of a certain operator? And by way of that, the spectrum of a theory that contains that operator. Is there a correlator bootstrap with Verasoro blocks? And uh, I'll try to convince you the answer is yes. Uh, and we'll use the cross ratio expansion of Verasoro blocks in a special setting where the coefficients are positive. So to set the stage, the story in D greater than two or in D equals two with global blocks, uh, as uh, we all know, uh, two and three point function, functions are fixed by a conformal symmetry, four point correlators are not. Here I'm displaying uh, a four point correlator of identical scalars, uh, U and V are the cross ratios and this G can be an arbitrary function of, of these cross ratios. Taking the OP inside the correlator leads to a conformal block decomposition, uh, which can be related in generic dimensions, going to a plane, mapping the four points to a plane and defining these C and Z bar coordinates on, on the plane. Uh, in even dimensions, conformal blocks are known explicitly in 2D, the global blocks are just these uh, hypergeometric functions. And the associativity of the OPE leads to the uh, crossing constraint. Uh, the, here you see the S-channel OPE, uh, uh, S-channel decomposition of the correlator, and here the T-channel decomposition. They should agree. So the difference, which I'll call the crossing function, uh, should give us zero. And uh, the spectrum needs to satisfy this for all values of U and V, which is non-trivial. The idea is to think of these crossing functions as infinite dimensional vectors. and to make them workable, project them onto a finite dimensional subspace, which is represented by this vector alpha here. So uh, then the idea is to propose a spectrum and look for separating planes. Uh, and if you can find a separating plane, these vectors cannot add to zero and the proposed spectrum is ruled out. I can, okay. Uh, so uh, to make that a little more precise, so this, uh, this was, uh, pioneered by these authors here. So the, the hypothesis uh, we'll think about is just like, I mean, take the two scalars and uh, just take, a, uh, take their OPE, there will be the identity operator and take a look at the first excited uh, scalar or non-scalar primary in, this, uh, in the OPE. And then uh, look for a linear functional that is non-negative on all the operators in the OPE and strictly positive in the, uh, on identity. And if you succeed in finding that hypothesis was wrong. So an example of this uh, for uh, Ising CFT in 2D using global blocks uh, is, uh, I'm, I'm taking this from Simmons, Duff and Stasi lectures. So in the Ising CFT, we have this uh, spin operator, which has dimension one over eight. And uh, uh, we can think of, we, we can just use this uh, H function that projects uh, the crossing functions onto a two dimensional plane. And then uh, to satisfy, we, we need to satisfy this crossing equation. And then uh, the, uh, this, uh, this alpha functional in this two dimensional plane is just mapped uh, the, uh, the trajectories of 
every, every event spin operator that appears in the, uh, in the OPE, uh, starting from the unitarity bound, uh, where one traces the tracks. And then uh, something interesting happens for the scalar, which traces this, uh, uh, which traces this interesting curve. And we see a, high, a separating plane appears here. That means we need to include this, uh, this part in the spectrum. And uh, so uh, the conclusion is there has to be a scalar with the uh, dimension lying in this, in this range here. So here is an upper bound on the, uh, on the scalar dimension. So this is pretty good since uh, delta O1 is one, uh, we, which we know from exact computations using the Rosoro blocks. So in cases where we don't know the answer, a bootstrap is powerful and useful. So uh, to give context to what we'll do with the Rasoro blocks, I'm going to mention an example uh, in, in three dimensions where conformal blocks are not available in closed form. So more general method than the previous one uh, to, 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 to project these crossing, crossing functions onto a finite dimensional vector space is to take derivatives around the crossing symmetric point and impose this positivity constraint. And then using the pole decomposition and the related recursive expansion of uh, 3D conformal blocks, these can be expressed in terms of a polynomial, uh, in terms of the dimension of the exchanged operator and some positive function. One then absorbs the positive function chi into the OP coefficients and works with this uh, polynomial basis to rule out uh, uh, proposed spectra. And we are going to do something similar with the Rasora blocks for which we have recursive uh, representations and the, and, and the positive and, and exactly this form, something polynomials and something positive in terms of these uh, finite dimensional projections. So uh, let's move on to 2D uh, CFT proper. Just a very short review. Uh, you all know 2D CFT has a local conformal symmetry. And the symmetry algebra is two copies of the infinite dimensional Virasora algebra, whose modes I have written here and, and, and the commutation relations. Among these, we have the Hamiltonian on the cylinder, which is L0 plus L0 bar. Uh, a representation of the Virasora algebra is specified by two numbers, the central charge and the dimension H, which is the eigenvalue of this L0 operator. So uh, let's look at uh, how a four-point correlator of scalars looks like, looks like in, in, in 2D CFT. Uh, what, what we usually do in 2D CFT, I mean, we are on a plane or the Riemann sphere using conformal symmetry. We map uh, uh, one point to zero, the other to one, and the other to infinity. And uh, the four-point function is, is a function of these two cross ratios, Z and Z bar. And then uh, this, this is decomposed in terms of Virasoro blocks. And uh, let's now focus on identical scalars. We have then these squared OP coefficients, which are positive, and these uh, plane or sphere uh, Virasoro blocks. Uh, unlike uh, global blocks, which are hypergeometric functions, we only have a series expansion for the Virasoro block. And I just wrote the, the first two terms in the series expansion. So the, these have been computed using just like uh, just Virasoro representation theory and uh, also some logical recursion relations to very high order in Z, but yeah, we don't know the full, uh, we don't have a full closed expression. So Zamalogikov uh, related the plane block to a new function that I have written uh, down here, which I'm going to call this uh, Zamalogikov H function. So let's just like uh, look at this a bit. Uh, we see these uh, plane cross ratio Z, they're mapped to this uh, elliptic modulus tau via, via this relation, where this is the uh, elliptic integral of the first kind. And then we have the elliptic gnome uh, that is the exponential in this form. And uh, he wrote down a recursion relation for the H function that gives its expansion in this, in this uh, Q variable elliptic gnome. Uh, so th this, this computation, this, this expression was due to uh, Liouville, semi-classical Liouville uh, computations. Yeah, it looks, uh, on the point of it, it looks like a complicated definition. And uh, thankfully, Maldacena, Simmons, Duffin, and Giberto gave an interpretation to this. And uh, this, uh, this interpretation uh, uses a map from the four function sphere to the pillow. So the plane block, um, this V of Z, uh, the composition of the correlator has a radius of convergence one as an expansion on Z. 
As in higher dimensions, this domain of analyticity can be extended to the entire z-plane minus a cut, but the full domain of analyticity is much larger since this Q expansion converges on the unit Q disk, and the entire z-plane is mapped to uh, the map to this uh, little sliver here. Uh, so to understand the geometry of this Q variable, we express the four-punching sphere as the <coughs> 2D torus modeled by a Z2, and which we'll, we, we will call this the peel of torus. And um, I haven't written down the details of this, but the map uh, from the sphere to the peel of torus lets us identify the peel of correlator uh, in terms of the plane correlator and uh, just uh, give, give, the, give these uh, elliptic theta uh, factors that we have seen before. Um, the crossing equation, which, uh, I mean, S to T channel crossing equation, which maps Z to one minus Z, Z bar to one minus Z bar, uh, becomes an S modular transformation on the pillar torus, then where this is the pillar correlator. This map contextualizes the analogical Q expansion and further lets us identify pillow blocks. We basically just take this uh, relation here and uh, it just invert it and identify this pillow block, uh, this lambda to the minus one multiplying this plane block just gives us, uh, ju just gives us this expression. And then we have, we have this pillow block uh, now being related to this homological H, fun uh, H function, which has a recursive expansion. And uh, the key idea from uh, Maldacena, Sinasdorf, and Gibera was uh, one of the key ideas was to quantize the theory on the pillow torus, picking the A cycle, uh, which, which is this guy here. We see the four, puncture, uh, four punctures of the pillow torus here. Um, a, a, a cycle as a spatial slice, the pillow block can be expressed as a norm, just this uh, propagation along the B cycle. Uh, actuated by this Q here and these uh, two O's at the bottom create this state psi and the, the upper O's create this this and uh, this bra version of it. So uh, what is nice about this is this means it has a positive expansion coefficients. So yes, this guy didn't, but this guy has to. Let's, uh, let's just, uh, let me just also remind you what this uh, recursion relation was that gave us this H expansion. So this uh, semiological recursion exploits the fact that uh, the Verma modules have null vectors at minimal model values. And then um, ergo, this, this, these H functions will have poles at these minimal model values and the residues can be expressed because these null vectors are also primary vectors. Okay, the, the residues can be expressed as uh, 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 other blocks at shifted values of the dimension. And, uh, he, he, yeah, he, he, I think there is no uh, the just uh, first principle derivation of this, but um, it has been tested to a very high order. And um, this uh, here I'm flashing to you, these RMN variables uh, taken from these formulas from, from this nice paper here. And these lambdas are basically functions of C and H. So H1 is related to lambda one. And here I have given uh, this P and Q that the, the, we are instructed to take a product over P and Q here uh, over this range. And um, this leads to expansion in Q. So for equal external dimensions where this lambda one will be equal to lambda two and lambda three will be equal to lambda four, this lambda P Q, P Q becomes bare and RMN becomes proportional to lambda P Q squared. So for both M and, uh, and both odd, because of this range, lambda p q squared will assume the value of zero. So that means all powers of q will be absent in this h function. So let's go back to the pillow expansion. And uh, this uh, pillow correlator, is, is, here we see the decomposition in terms of the pillow blocks. Using the map that I flashed to you in terms of the lambdas, we related this uh, pillow block to this h function here. And uh, the, as we have seen, this H has a Q expansion and uh, using this Q expansion and using this map, we write down a Q expansion for the pillow block as we have seen here. So this H minus C over 24 appear here and this uh, Q expansion from, from this guy just appears uh, as integer powers of Q here. So this results in a Q expansion for the pillow correlator. 
And uh, what I've done is just absorb this overall factor for photoconformal family into, into this uh, OP coefficient and re redefine, uh, redefine it as C tilde. It's a positive factor. And then we see these uh, AM, uh, the co expansion coefficients appear here. So the, the, the strategy will be to compute a fixed number of expansion coefficients for H and then plug the resulting series in, in, this, in this guy here that we see here. And then uh, we'll get, we, we, from that, we'll com we, uh, we can compute these AM expansion coefficients and check that they're positive. Just, uh, just to give an example, so this, uh, I uh, go back to Ising CFT at central charge one half to see uh, to positivity of these co uh, coefficients AM. So uh, let's look at this four point function of spin operators, which, uh, which are scalars actually. And uh, <clears throat> this is the correlator. It decomposes in terms of your sorrow blocks. There are just like two uh, families appearing, the identity and, and the epsilon, which has dimension one half. And uh, just using, uh, using the fact that the, 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 uh, these uh, null vectors, these f of c z bar satisfy some differential equations, and then they can be explicitly solved. And the, this, uh, this, these blocks can be computed like this. We can just plug in this result and get this h function for the uh, epsilon exchange block. And the homology of h appears like this, as promised, it, it has even powers. This property persists for this uh, pillow block. Also, it's again even powers. But as you see here, uh, the H function is not necessarily all positive. There are negative guys, but this this thing, uh, the pillow block, as promised, has positive coefficients. So that was just an example to just convince you what is what has positive coefficients. So uh, let's. Okay, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so you mentioned that you are planning to study the crossing for this uh, correlator, uh, pillow correlator. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's the the good moment to ask the question, but is the crossing for the pillow correlator, how does it relate to the crossing of the usual correlator? Is it equivalent or is it stronger somehow? Is it, uh, yeah, is it obvious? I don't know. I missed that point. So, uh, so this, uh, so this, Crossing relation just directly implies this guy, but uh, the, uh, for the pillow correlator, but okay. this pillow correlator has uh, has a much larger radius of convergence, if you like. So if you decompose this guy in in, in the uh, plane uh, blocks, you only have the z plane available to you, but this guy converges on the entire unit Q disk. So you if I decompose the usual correlator in terms of the logical blocks uh, in terms of Q variable, would that be exactly equivalent to studying the crossing for pillow correlator? You said yes, so I guess I think so. Yes, yes, yes. This is directly just like uh, taking this and plugging uh, this formula there, you get that. The only thing is you need tau in the upper half plane and tau bar being the complex conjugate in the lower half plane. That's uh, but yeah, it's exactly how you derive this thing. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, yes, so let's look at uh, the, again, uh, the pillow of uh, torus and focus on a rectangular torus. Uh, so parameterized star is I beta. Uh, this is because of the Z2, there's a pi here, not two pi. And tau bar is the complex coordinate uh, conjugate. And uh, I define this delta as the, the sum of the chiral dimensions as usual, and E always stands for this combination here. Then yeah, basically just plug, just writing this thing out at this uh, rectangular torus values, you get this expansion. This is the identity block, zero stands for uh, E sub zero, uh, Z stands for the identity um, energy uh, or this guy here minus C over 12. And this is the first excited state. And we have this uh, A2s appearing here only even coefficients appear, as I said, and there are an infinite number more and infinite number more primaries. So let's just look at this A2 coefficient, uh, which uh, I flashed to you for the minimal values, for, but for generic values of the external dimensions and central charge. And here is the expression. So yeah, this is supposed to be positive, but uh, it, it's non-trivial to see that. So uh, just by inspection, the denominator is positive for C greater than one and all real H. H is the exchange dimension. 
And the numerator is positive for the usual uh, unitary values of the central charges and dimensions. So again, uh, I'm showing you this uh, 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 plane crossing relation and uh, it's being mapped to the uh, modular crossing equation on the pillow torus. And uh, here we, we actually follow a strategy, uh, the, the modular bootstrap strategy followed by Hellerman and uh, on an actual torus, but for the pillow torus, parameterizes tau's e, uh, i e to the p and tau bar is i e to the p minus i e to the p. And these, these guys are the uh, crossing transform versions of these guys. We are interested in an expansion around the crossing symmetric point. Here are the three ways to see it at z equals one half, tau equals to i, p equals to zero. But we'll use this p variable and we'll basically plug this tau and tau bar values in this crossing relation here. And he, he, he is, uh, we, uh, what we see here, uh, uh, here we see just that. And um, the idea is to take derivatives of this relation with respect to p and set p to zero. This is just like uh, taking the with respect to z and setting it to uh, one half. In terms of beta, uh, what we do is take the pillow correlator and uh, just act, act on it with derivatives. The, the p derivatives um, on the left-hand side become uh, beta del beta. p derivatives on the right-hand side become minus beta del beta. We can act with arbitrary derivatives as we like and setting p to zero it corresponds to setting beta to zero. So for each M, we get a transcendental equation for the spectrum, by which I mean just something that involves exponentials. Uh, exponentials. So uh, just for notation, uh, I'll denote the contribution of each conformal family in this form. So this EK uh, just refers to OK, and uh, always E is related to delta as in the usual way. So we are going to focus on M equals one and three. In, in this relation here, because m equals to two is linearly dependent, uh, it's just like i1. Uh, so one and three are given by this. Um, so we see all sorts of things appearing here, the central charge, external dimension, and the, and, and, and the exchange uh, operator. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, mi I missed the notation. So it was, it went, went fast. So what are mm -hmm. the yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, where are the control blocks? How do they, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit lost, sorry. So here, uh, I am takes, it. I am is a functional, it takes anything you like and it, uh, applies to it this guy. Okay. And then, it, then it applies to uh, the uh, pillow correlator, it, it needs to give to zero, give you okay. zero. Now I'm thinking of this expansion here, G, it just involves some exponentials, right? And some coefficients. And now I'm showing you um, what. Are, are you going to use anything about the coefficients apart from them being positive? Uh, the, not not in this talk. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm actually I am going to. Then I, yes, I'm going to use them. But uh, to to derive the existence of the bounds, I'm only going to use that if they are non-negative. But so we are going to kind of throwing out a lot of information. You're going to work only on the diagonal. You are not using anything about the coefficients and still something useful is going to come out. Yes, yes, something, uh, something useful is going to come out. And um, the, the, when, you want to, when you decide to use the full chiral dependence of these coefficients, again, something useful will come out that will just be like uh, ruling out regions in H, H bar plane for the first excited primary, but I'm not gonna show that in this talk. I'm gonna assume it's scalar, and then I'm gonna rule out uh, regions in the delta one plane, which is definitely the first excited, but you can do it uh, in, in the H, H bar plane also. So, yeah, I also have another question. So I seem to remember there were some works uh, which pointed out i think miranda chang was yeah we should pointed out some analogies between uh indeed the modular bootstrap uh, and four point function bootstrap mm -hmm. which seems to be coming up again but i forgot exactly what that analogy was and uh, i i'm going to comment on like for example, the bounds that you're going to derive, could they be just derived from modular bootstrap results through some trick without redirect without 
because now start everything starts looking very much like modular bootstrap. So you could say, well, maybe you could just by some trick, uh, you know, say that in fact these four point functions are equal to partition functions in some other CFT. And maybe you could derive the results. Uh, something like arguments like that, weren't they made? Uh, I seem to remember vaguely that something like that was said by someone before. So um, so I actually am not aware of uh, Chang's uh, work. But uh, uh, the, fir the, the, first, uh, the first time, uh, the, the way I saw this, but there was a comment in this Maldacena, Simmons, and Gibraltar paper. They were just saying, OK, this looks like exactly like modular bootstrap except that the coefficients are not integer, but they're positive. So it was commented in that paper. But uh, the difference from modular bootstrap, we have, we have information about the external dimensions. So I'm not exactly sure how you would map the, 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 the actual CFT torus, how you would incorporate the external dimensions uh, data into some kind of modular bootstrap. But this uh -huh. is, the, yeah, this is basically just, uh, Pillow bootstrap, which I think is different from uh, actual torus bootstrap. Okay, okay, let's keep going. Maybe yeah. I'll I'll, I'll yeah, try to yeah. trace, trace that claim later. But yeah. I just want to make a small remark. So, so on, on the Cheng paper, the one I believe you're thinking about, they they are studying um, rational CFTs, and the thrust of that paper was to study four point functions in rational CFTs and construct them as gluings of vector valued modular forms, which are the same objects that appear when you construct partition functions of rational CFTs, and they try to draw a correspondence between four-point functions of operators with certain dimensions um, and partition functions of certain vertex operator algebras. Um, but they didn't have anything more general to say about the irrational CFT world. Ah, OK. Maybe maybe that's uh, worth Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Um, <coughs> OK. So yes, these, uh, yeah, maybe this is a little fast, but uh, so this, this thing is a functional and it, it takes exponentials uh, because this G of beta is decomposed in exponentials. And I'm just showing to you what the first and third derivatives do to these exponentials. It, it, it because of all of these uh, C delta O's appearing here and then setting it to pi, you see all these pi's, E's, C's and delta O's here. And the crossing equations for the first and third derivatives become, become these guys here. Here is the identity block. Uh, so first derivative applied is equal to the rest of the operators. And, uh, and here we see the third derivative version of that. And we, we do exactly modular bootstrap. So taking the ratio of the two crossing equations, um, we need to get this, uh, except, uh, yeah, this won't be true if, if uh, the identity block, you know, only identity block appears, which happens in certain neural mm -hmm. models. But yeah, in generic CFTs, uh, irrational, we expect uh, more, more than the identity to appear here. And uh, here, here is the equation that you'll treat. Um, and I'm slashing it to you uh, here again. And I'm, uh, the idea is to think of this crossing um, equation as a function of the dimension of the first excited primary in the OPE of delta O's, which I'm denoting delta sub one, which can be spinning or a scalar. And I claim this crossing function is greater than zero if this delta one is greater than some, some finite value, which, we, which we'll compute. And um, uh, to prove the claim, uh, we're going to truncate the crossing equation and define crossing functions. Here I'm outlining the algorithm. I'll, I'll go into details in a moment. So for the fully truncated crossing function, which I denote Q sub zero, uh, I'm gonna show it's greater than zero for delta greater than some uh, delta sub B, which will compute. And step, step by step, we'll untruncate by adding more terms from the Q extension and the rest of the primaries, and we'll approximate the crossing equation. And at each step, we'll show the boundaries improved. For example, for when we, in the first untruncation of, of the fully truncated thing, we're going to see it's going to be positive for a larger part, part, part of the real line, and we will have improved our bound from delta B to delta B prime. And then as we add more and more terms, we, we will only improve our bound. And then I'll basically report this guy analytically, 
and this guy numerically, and the next guy also numerically for fixed values of C and delta. So how does this go? So let's go to the, uh, the fully uh, truncated crossing function, which involves just one primary and one term from the Q expansion. So remember, this was the thing and uh, the crossing uh, functional. Um, just picking one primary, the C is canceled and we are left with uh, this, this guy here. And uh, here I'm writing the- uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm confused. What is the meaning of this truncation? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't understand. What does it mean to truncate the crossing function? So you, it, it, in, in, it didn't give the definition of QAN, so I'm confused. I'm gonna give, give, give them, here I'm giving it. For example, Q0 is that. I'm gonna give them step by step. I was just like telling you how the story sure. before in slides, in, uh, but I haven't tell, told you what. But what's the point of studying this Q zero delta? I don't understand. So Q Q zero is delta. Uh, the, the point is we're gonna show that this is this is uh, greater than zero if delta is greater some uh, fixed value, and then we're going to uh, pretend that Q zero is an actual crossing function and then rule out this guy. And then we're no, gonna- well, let's pretend that is what I don't understand. Is this a rigorous pretend? Because you seem, you're, 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 you're saying that this bound is going to improve, but is this just an observation by inspection or do we know that that's supposed to happen? I, I'll prove to you, I'll try to convince you that it is improved at each step. That's, that's the idea. But why? I mean, this seems to be rather mysterious. Uh, yeah. So it's just because of because of the convexity properties of this crossing function, um, as as we are going to see. So maybe an example will help. Then uh, in two slides, maybe you can uh, you can uh, uh, redirect your complaints and see if if it makes sense or not. No, this doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry because because you started you started by saying okay, this is the bootstrap conference, blah blah. You told us that you know everything about functionals. Uh, Hellerman also phrased his results about functionals, and now you, you now it's just becoming some voodoo. What is the meaning of this in terms of functionals? That you Slava, I, I really propose we go two more slides. Let Mert explain his proposal, and then we then we complain. Let's okay. just wait two more slides. He didn't, didn't explain still. Okay, it is actually yeah. It it, it I, I understand it feels like voodoo, but yeah, it's. Uh, uh, let, let's see how it goes. Um, so yeah, uh, at this point, you're just believing me and I'm, I'm defining this Q0 guy here. And um, it's uh, just this uh, ratio of these I3 divided by I1 and uh, the exponentials cancel. And this is a convex function away from a pole. And uh, the reason is just like the, the formula that I showed to you, this is, uh, this is something that increases uh, to infinity. And um, there is a pole located at this value. And I, here I'm flashing to you an example at this like random value of uh, C 11.5, delta 4.9. And then here we see above this 13.5 value, this guy is positive. And I'm, I'm just flashing to you the uh, analytic formula for this guy. Of course, at this point, you don't believe this, but now I'm going to get one step closer to the full crossing function. And this guy will just move a little more to the left. And then I will, I, I, I will hope that you'll get convinced that this, that this bound was correct. And let's just look at this. Again, in the example, uh, now this crossing function is positive for a larger portion of uh, the real line. And uh, our bound has improved from 13.5 to 12.5. How did this happen? So, okay, let, let, let me just tell you how uh, we approximated this uh, the crossing function a little better. Well, this positive, I understand the positive is, is an arbitrary coefficient, right? Sorry, what? Positive is what? Positive is an, the, the, the thing which is called positive on the slide. Is it yes. a number or is it an arbitrary coefficient which has to be positive? It is a coefficient that depends on the external dimension, central charge and uh, E or delta. That, that, that can be computed. And I have computed it. Yeah. And that is, the, that is how I got the plot. But so the plot is made for a certain number of external C and delta O, okay. Yes. Okay, okay so that's 
the ratio is okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that is what happened in the example. And uh, why why did we get a better bound? And uh, this is okay. This is just uh, the idea is to show that the better crossing function Q two um, is positive at the uh, at the bound. Uh, at which the previous crossing function was zero. So if we can show this generally, then we will have improved our bound from going to zero to two. And uh, the, why is that? So to, in, in just like in explicit form, the, the inequality that we want to show is our two of delta beta at this previous bound is greater than um, R2 of zero and R0 uh, minus R0 of zero. And I, ju I just took this equation and reshuffled, reshuffled the uh, constituents. And um, to remind to you, R0 is this guy here and R2 is this guy here. It's just R2 is constructed from R0 using these, uh, uh, just like um, adding, adding the same thing with some positive, positive coefficients here. So. Okay, so why is this guaranteed to hold? This one is guaranteed by the convexity R0 of delta, which is a fact of Virasora algebra. I, I just flashed to you, it's, it's, it's this guy here. It is convex. So what, what is this? Uh, how do we show that one is true? It's basically the, the, this, this thing here. If, if you start with A over B and add this C over, D, uh, C over D to it in this form, which is exactly what we're doing here, this will be greater. Uh, if C over D is greater than A over B for all positive A, B, C, D. The thing is, um, the left-hand side increased more than the right-hand side by this new construction here, because on the, on the right-hand side, we are at this point here, and on the right-hand side, we are at this point here. Because of this convexity away from this pole, you just add more terms uh, at this point for this guy, and you add just more terms at this, uh, for the zero guy from here. Okay. Uh, the, by virtue of this, this is guaranteed to happen, and I actually checked it. Uh, it happens for all arbitrary generic uh, values of uh, c greater than one and delta o. Uh, maybe there is a better way to phrase this along the lines of just like the usual, uh, like three D bootstrap using these positive functions and polynomials and so on. But yeah, this this is this is what I have so far. Um, so. <clears throat> So the new bound is located <coughs> at the zero of this new crossing function Q2. And uh, uh, as I try to convince you because of this positive coefficients, this is smaller than the original bound. And similarly, we construct this R4 by adding more terms. It, it, these are positive. So as we keep adding them, we just, uh, we just improve our bound. This Q4 at the previous bound is actually greater than zero, which which was the zero of the previous guy. I, I, I think I'm missing some elementary step in the logic. So why do you say this is a bound? You have, you had in the previous slide, you had some, or a few slides back, you had this sum over K, sum over operators in the numerator there. You have a sum over operators in the numerator and in the denominator, mm -hmm. but I don't see why the, res the, the numerical results that you have found so far lead to a bound. It's like if this sum would be a single sum over ratios, then probably it would be true. But I just, yeah, so why, is, why do we have a bound? So he, he, here is, <clears throat> let me just like read this claim again. So this is the full crossing equation, right? I claim this is positive. If delta one, the first excited state is greater than some finite value, which I, which I keep computing in this recursive fashion here. So uh, the, the, the better I approximate, the better I approximate the crossing function, the, uh, the, the larger the region uh, for this delta one becomes at, the, uh, at which this full crossing function, which is supposed to be zero, it becomes guaranteed to be greater than zero. And I'm doing it, it step by step. So, the, so, do, I mean, do you, do you agree that well, if, if I can show this claim, I will have- It's not a function of just delta one. I mean, it's a function of delta one and all of the other, all other operators that are in this theory, right? Of delta two, delta three, uh, there are infinitely many primaries in that correlator. Why are you showing just delta one? 
because I'm thinking of this crossing function as a function of delta one. And it's not a function of delta one. It's a function of a gazillion other things. And I know. Are, the, the, gazillion, the gazillion other things have this one key property. They're all above delta one. So the that's the, that's the input. So. Okay. But I'm not uh, like for me. It's not delta b infinity, right? I'm already stuck at delta b. <laughs> so you're uh, you. Um, it's okay to be that the stuck at delta b, but uh, if you can, uh, if I can convince you delta b infinity is smaller than delta b, then I will have shown you the bound. Is that correct? But you say it is positive for delta greater than delta b yes right q0 of delta and... yes yeah but why uh, so if q so how did we show that q0 of delta is greater than zero for delta greater than delta b we just looked at the explicit expression here here but this is an approximation to the full oh. sum in the left and in the previous slide right you had the sum of arbitrary operators yes no, but we are going step by step. So I just first need to convince you Q0 is greater than zero for delta greater than delta B. But yes, then so I need to do it in a such a weird way. I mean, we are 10 years after Hellerman. Hellerman did exactly the same problem. He just didn't have delta zero there. And, and you are doing it in such a weird way so that we are, so we are puzzled if you have a rigorous proof or not. This just seemed to be... Yeah, the reason I have to do this in this weird way, the, the thing is the, what Hellerman had was just E there. So he could just like uh, do a division and move everything to the right and everything was positive. I don't have E there. I have this complicated function of C, delta O and delta E of an E. So I have to go through this complicated procedure. He was, there was no delta O there. I mean, it was just- so Let me ask you a concrete question. Do you yeah. have a rigorous proof that this function, so you have this function which is given by the sum over k divided by a sum over k. Yeah. Do you have a rigorous proof that that function is larger than q0? Yes. Okay, if you have it, then I, I just conclude that you have the proof, but you chose a strange way to present it, but I believe you. Yeah, I, I agree, it's a bit strange and yeah, it's, it's Maybe, yeah, I, I should be. So yes, that is exactly what I call. Um, yes, so this, the, this is uh, what is here, here you're only arguing that it's at the transition point, delta B prime, that it's bigger. Can you show that it's bigger for all delta, that Q4 is bigger than Q2, bigger than Q0, that there's some ordering? Uh, so, you, you're saying, uh, so how do I get from delta B double uh, prime to uh, Q infinity? That's the question. You're just showing, I think, how the zero moves. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess you still have to show that uh, the positive part remains positive when you go from Q0 to Q2, to, I guess. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because, because I'm just adding positive guys here, you see? I mean, it has to stay positive. I mean, uh, here, Delta B was by definition uh, to the mm -hmm. point above, uh, beyond which this Q0 was positive. And I'm just adding larger and larger fractions into the numerator and denominator. So I keep increasing this fraction. That's the idea. I'm sorry, if you add something large to the denominator, that doesn't mean that the function yeah, is- The thing is, I, I, start with, I start with this A over B and add to it a C over D. Mm -hmm. That is greater than a over b. That's what I do. And this is true, right? This this relation here. That's what I'm using. I start with a fraction, and I, I take the same exact fraction because it's the same thing. You see, it's uh, it, this was e to the minus theta e. It's the same fraction, but just a little to the right of the original one, e plus two. But by definition, when you add two to e, you will have moved to the, the, a little to the right. So you're adding a little larger fraction. And- It, is like a, a, it sounds like a discussion of calculus before calculus was invented. And it's like a one line proof of what you are explaining to us, but- I agree, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Just then, type the ratio and say, okay- Yes, yes, I completely- sum. Let's split the sum into two sums. 
Yes, yes. First term yes. goes everything else, and then yeah, and that's you know, that's how the proof goes. I, I completely <laughs> agree, and I, I intend to do that. And I was just like, yeah, okay, let let, let me do this this way. It was okay. the most pedestrian and a little, little unconvincing as we have seen way to do it, but yeah. I believe it is correct. So, so I, I still have a final question. Look, why uh -huh. do you have the same energy in numerator and denominator all the time? Um, so define the same E. Can you say define what? Sorry. You have an E in the numerator and denominator that's always the same. That, that is the strategy I'm advocating. Uh, the, the, I have to give you one way to systematically approach the crossing equation. And my way of doing that is just add exactly the same terms at each uh, untruncation level to the numerator and the denominator. So the, it's just one way of systematic. All right, all right, I see, I see, okay. Thanks, but you're gonna have different e's at some point, right? It's not just e plus two, but also the other the other guy. Yeah, so yeah. At some so point, you're going to have a new guy with undetermined coefficients. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And I'll I'll uh, I'll get to that after this slide here. So let me just again. All right, thanks. Was there a question? Or... Okay. Um, so yeah, again, the, this example here, it's just moves slightly. And uh, yeah, the pole shifts a little bit, that's unimportant. Um, okay, so now we need to, we need to, okay, wait, where was this? So now we need to add uh, rest of the primaries. And uh, again, uh, what we do is just like, is if we go back to the, uh, the, the, the fully truncated crossing function, and add to this this new guy uh, in the in the in the OPE E two and uh, the basic property of uh, this new guy is its dimension is greater than delta. What have I done? I st I started with my R zero and just increased it a little bit, pushing the bound a little further to the left. So, and uh, because this guy these guys are again uh, positive. So by uh, this is this is a system. So. I think this is a systematic way to prove that as you, as you go to, as you keep adding all the other, the rest of the primaries, you just get, uh, you just uh, get better and better and better bounds by, because everything is positive. Yeah. Excuse uh, me. Uh, yeah. uh, can you go back one slide? So mm -hmm. now this ratio of the OP coefficients, these are not really our, so this can be arbitrary positive numbers, right? Yes. Unlike yes. the previous case. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so was it important for your previous case that those positive numbers are not arbitrary, but some something very special which you compute? So they were important important in making these plots. I used the uh, actual zoological recursion guys, but they were unimportant in proving the existence of a bound. I see. If you want to compute the, the, what the bound is, you need to compute them. Actually, uh, this for this Q2 here, uh, because, of, because those coefficients depend on H and H bar, the, the actual plot you'll get is, that is, is, is a plot of the crossing function in H, H bar plane, and you rule out regions uh, in H, H bar plane where, where this Q2 is positive definite. But if you assume this first excited guy is a scalar, then you can give a two-dimensional plot and you can get this, which is how I got this. I used the zoological. Yeah, I, I, I guess I am worried about the fact where you show that C over D is greater than A over B. So, and then you use that A. So yeah, here in this slide, you assume the C over D is greater than A over B, mm -hmm. but is it guaranteed if the positive number is arbitrary, then this should hold or am I missing something? The, the, the thing is, um... The, I'm just comparing these fractions, right? So this, uh, I can add here like any, um, yeah, as long as it's positive, it, 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 I think it is guaranteed. If, if, if it is negative. Um, I think it's important. The only thing which is important is that the positive number in the numerator and the positive in the numerator is the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So exactly, exactly. And I think it, it's true, so. <laughs> and C I over think... D is equal to one? Sorry? Is C over D equal to one? Or not? Oh, it's I3 of I, over I1. I see. Thanks, Ro. Yeah. Okay. Is there any, um, so you're doing two, two, 
systematic improvements. One is the one you've been talking about until this most recent slide, which is adding terms in the queue expansion from the block effectively of the primary that you're considering. And then the next is making an argument that when you add new primaries, yeah. everything stays kosher. But yeah. depending on the gap between delta one and delta two, uh, the second correction might come first. When when I and when I say first, I mean ordering in delta. Does this effect matter? I'm I'm getting a little um, confused in, in just trying to understand how the two types of corrections you're having to do play with each other. And I'm a little worried maybe that if the gap between delta one and delta two were less than two, say, do you have to yeah. worry about them in opposite order and make a, a different argument? So is yeah, true so, or not? Uh, so the uh, the thing is, um, so, so the actual thing, I mean, if you want to get, get the best bounds, um, you, you, you would need to start from and like, you would, uh, so um, you would need to start with just like adding this, uh, the first excited primary on, onto the Q expansion. And you need to do what I have shown for a single primary, you need to do the, it simultaneously for the second guy. But uh, the only thing that I'm trying to convince you is that the bound stays intact. It's just like, um, and this is what I'm flashing to you here, R0. Uh, so this, this should have been, by the way, Q0. Uh, this, this is the definition of R0, uh, R0, but the claim I'm making is for Q0 which was uh, zero at delta B, but once you added this thing, it's greater because you just increased it. So uh, at each step, there are improvements of, of the bound uh, and it's only improvements you get. And uh, okay, I, I, don't, I don't know what are the general forms of the bound, but I'm, I'm actually uninterested in that. I, I just want to report a bound and uh, that's, I mean, at least mm -hmm. in this short representation, that's... Uh... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think this goes well, but for example, in this, arg in this argument about A, B, C, and D, mm -hmm. if you're adding the descendant of the sum of two different primaries, um, then the statement that the same constant is being added in the numerator and denominator is not, not true anymore. So that's an example of the kind of thing I'm confused about. So the, the but, but I mean, there's always a way in which you can add the same thing into the numerator and the denominator, right? You can always do that. I mean, the, whatever you're doing, you can do it in that way. I thought it was determined just by the form of the recursion combined with your uh, I1 and I3 functionals. So the, the constants are given by some logic of and this ratio of OP coefficients. So there's not complete freedom. No, no, no. Uh, so, but I'm what I'm uh, saying is you can uh, start with this zero order thing, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a way to approximate to, to get to the full crossing function, uh, a collection of steps, uh, and such that you, at each step you add the same thing to the numerator and the denominator. Is is that wrong? Uh, I don't know if it's wrong, and I, um, so, I mean, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just like this I3 appears in the numerator and I1 in the denominator. That's the only difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, always, the, uh, since they're taking the ratio of two crossing, they, they look exactly the same. So you can always systematically improve your fractions such that you have the same terms. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I mean, maybe there's a better way to uh, put, uh, probably go through this now, I think. But yeah. I, I can suggest what the better way is. Instead of adding things to the crossing function, you should start with the crossing function. You just rewrite the numerator as a sum of two terms, the denominator as a sum of two terms, and you just write a one line proof while this is larger than Q0. Yeah. And then we wouldn't be having this discussion, which is now lasting 20 minutes, which is basically could be shut down in one line proof. I agree. I agree. I agree. Yes. Okay. And here, here is this result. And uh, here is something that you shouldn't do actually, because for the, I mean, uh, uh, minimal models, these coefficients, I'm using the zoological relations for the minimal models, but they are not, they are positive only at discrete values uh, for C smaller than uh, one. And you see all these like weird oscillations here, but uh, sometimes you get lucky and uh, this guy gets a chance to find its convex nature and then, then it just like crosses and this is the bound you get. Um, 
And here it's a more nerve-wracking example. You have all these uh, also like infinities appearing and then finally it gets the chance to find its nature and then it crosses at 1.2002, which I mean, this is the exact result. Uh, but in, in other cases, you, you, just, you just suffer too much from the negativity of the coefficients and this guy is a little upwards and then, um, and then you get no bound. But again, this method was not meant to apply to many models anyway, but um, it's just a fun thing to see. Uh, so the last thing I want to say is the large C limit of this thing um, is linear in C. And um, if you just like uh, think of a bulk dual then the, and take this delta O to be order, order C to the zero, this multi-traces will just couple to O and trivially satisfy this problem. So there is not much to say there. And that was all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, can you just show the last slide again? It was too fast to your, your last slide. And, uh, and of course it's open for questions. If you, I guess Scott already has a question. Go, go ahead, Scott. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. So as you mentioned at the end, uh, we know that in the OPE, uh, say of this external scalar operator with itself, we know that there are multi-twist operators. Mm -hmm. Now we know we only really know their twist asymptotically at large spin. So I guess I could interpret your result as giving uh, a bound on the anomalous dimension of the lightest double trace operator. Now, as you say, when the external operator is light in the large C limit has dimension order one, then the bound is kind of trivial. Yes. But maybe it's more interesting if you take the external operator to have dimension of order C? Like, yeah. does it get more non-trivial in that case? Um, yeah, I, I think I did that. It's, it's just like the, the, the this, this is the generic feature. It's, um, so this is, for example, when you start from 4.9, you get 13 points. So it's uh, pushed forward. So if you take the modular bootstrap result, for example, just say, I, I don't know, C over eight, whatever was the latest bound. And then, if you include something like C over eight, you, you, you will get something like uh, in the black hole regime. And I think then that is also trivial. Uh, right, but it could be a dimension say below. We don't, we, in fact, we only know that the multi-twists exist for sufficiently light external operators. Uh -huh, I see, I, I, I need Dimension to... less than like roughly C over 16. And it, it might compare more favorably to the lightest uh, double trace in that case. So what exactly is the proposal? Just to look at this um, light uh, enough? Well, ju just take, you can consider the large C, your bound in the large C limit, but also take the external dimension to be of order C, but mm -hmm. say less than C over 16. So that it is it is a single trace. So that we know that there there do exist multi-twist multi operators and you can compare the resulting bound. I mean, it could be that the bound is still in the black hole regime, in which case it's kind of not interesting, but. I guess it's from what you've shown, it's not guaranteed to be the case, I think. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Another comment or a question is if you take um, the dimension to be a Z2 twist, that of a Z2 twist operator, mm -hmm. the, the, does it literally just reduce to Hellerman, what Hellerman did? It seems to, yeah. So it's, um, so the, this, this result, is, is still applicable in that case. Right, there, is right. no, there is no pole, and but still the expression of the bound in terms of this non-existent non pole is still this guy. So it's uh -huh. still like that, but there is no pole. Uh, but this result is still the same. Um, yeah, this expression stays intact. Uh, but the, the, then if, if I had picked like, just like you said, like C equals 16 delta O, like more generically than the Z2 thing, then uh, we wouldn't have had this, these questions. Everything would be extremely simple because it would be a Hellerman computation. I mean- I Okay, so it does just literally reduce to- yeah. The, yeah. Okay, I see, good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I actually wanted to follow up on, on Scott's suggestion. So for example, could we do could we do kind of a two-step procedure indeed? So first we use modular bootstrap, which tells us that there has to be an operator be below dimension whatever, C over eight. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And then we apply your procedure to that operator, which we now exists, which we now know exists. And the question is, could we then, using your procedure or some improvement to your procedure, to improve on this CR8 and show that even something lower than CR8 exists, or or would this procedure just yeah, or would we discover nothing interesting? Yeah, that would be interesting. Yes, uh, I mean, I need to see how this thing works out. But uh... my guess is that to get something interesting, you probably need to take the external operator significantly below the best, the current best modular bootstrap band. Yeah, that's a, a kind of like. A... Uh -huh. uh, why? Why do you think so, Scott? Is there some, some intuition? Well, the intuition based on multi-twist operators suggests that. Like there aren't even multi-twist operators and like discrete towers of multi-twist operators uh, unless the dimension is below like C over 16. Um, and I, I think Mert also made a comment in answering my question that um, if you take Delta to be like C over eight or whatever the best modular bootstrap bound is, you get something, the resulting OPE bound is like in the black hole threshold. Hmm. I need to double check that, but I, I think that's what I, um, but yeah, it's, it, sh it should be easy to show. And it's also suggested by the, the fact that if you take the dimension to be the Z2, that of the Z2 twist operator, then it should exactly reproduce Hellerman's result, which is C over six, twice the black hole threshold. I, I think I played with the expression may not be on the slide. So, I mean, the question here amounts, I think, for one version of it anyway, to, you know, to dialing delta O and asking if, Delta B is ever actually less than delta O. Yeah. And I played with this expression, and that and that's, doesn't seem to happen even for order one dimension. So um, whether an optimized version of this would improve, I don't know. But I, um, yeah, when Rod's paper came out, I, I played around, and I think that's the case. Hmm. OK. So, so Mert, but. I mean, is there a systematic way to improve this? I mean, you you only use this this diagonal part of crossing, and um, so, and so also the in the functional, it seems you're just looking at one specific functional, this i one over i three. So what is? Yeah, the, uh, so one like obvious way to improve this would be, I mean, uh, to just uh, look at the h h bar plane, right? But I, I didn't know how interesting would that be. So just like rule out positive definite uh, regions of these crossing functions in the HH bar plane. Um, that's one thing. And the other is, as you're suggesting, going to higher derivatives. And um, yeah, if, 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 yeah I, I need to find some, yeah, some like, I guess, I, I don't know, in the monster CFT or something, these, this is probably trivial. Um, yeah, some motivation to, to, to actually. Well, I think what I did not understand is why the standard uh, bootstrap methods do not apply here just by changing blocks from global to Virazoro and, and uh, running the machinery of putting more and more derivatives and this part yes. I did not understand. Yeah, it should it should work. Yes, yeah, it should make things these things better. Yes, and this is already like I mean. The, the delta bound prime in this example is just, I mean, for example, for the Ising model, so this, del this is delta bound prime, uh, double prime, by the way. This is like the fourth thing. The delta B that I'm flashing to you here, this is like 1.2 or something. So adding two more terms, you already get extremely close to the actual value. Um, so in this case, like adding more derivatives, uh, like I five or whatever, wouldn't, be much better, but for different model, larger dimensions, I guess it might be more important. Um, but uh, here, this, by the way, this is like 1.2 or something, uh, the, the analytic thing, it's, it's not good. This, this but, I agree. The, the, it would be interesting to find like, what is the simplest CFT with center charge larger than one and things like that. And there are lots of interesting questions. One doesn't have to go immediately to large C, I think. And it depends on what your physics goals are. But if, I think, you know, it would be nice to encourage everyone to look at C 
see if T is the center charge larger than one and then see what can be said about them. I would be very happy to hear if you have any suggestions like in, in that direction, like specific. I mean, uh, there are some uh, well-known problems which have been around for decades, like uh, like uh, the CFT, which describes three copies of the POTS model coupled together, and there are, which is supposed to be the simplest uh, irrational CFT, except that we don't know if it's true or not. Um, so it would be nice to bootstrap such theories. I think you mentioned before going into the H, H bar plane. I think it's still an open question whether the lightest operator, lightest primary operator has to be scalar. So, so uh, here, this, this, this bound is for, a, for the first excited primary, which can be spinning or scalar. Right. Um, I'm just suggesting oh, this by way of a uh, open ah, problem. I see. You know, yeah, I, I see. Um, okay. If you could do the spinning version, uh, perhaps you could address that that open question. Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, I would also be interested in like understanding these. Um, I mean, the bootstrap machinery to to say things about OP coefficients, but I'm 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 not an expert on these things. Uh, can I ask a technical question? Hmm? Um, can I ask a technical question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. So um, the reason you're able to apply this to the minimal models mm -hmm. is that you're just using functionals which don't go up to high enough level that the null states kick in. Is that why? So, so uh, yes. So this is this is the this is the shape that you should mm -hmm. that you get for C greater than one, and this is a generic mm -hmm. shape. And the thing wants to do this, but these guys' uh, coefficients have poles, and it just like struggles to make that shape, and then find its shape. If it can find its shape before the would-be bound, it just happens to give the right result. So it's uh, it's the same thing here. It's um, yeah. Um, so the, that in, in in some minimal models, this does it's, this just doesn't work, and, uh, and you, you you literally see this thing, but shift it a little upwards so it never crosses zero. So there is no bound and uh, there is no way, it mm -hmm. seems like there's no way, set, but of course that's wrong. We did something wrong. By the, the reason we, we should um, sort of leave these plots from a more principled point of view is that, I mean, can you see that the null states that appear in the middle models just are not affecting the calculation in a more definite way? In other words, uh, the fact I, that the blocks are not the generic blocks in minimal models, they, they have, I mean, Maybe it doesn't matter because you're using the recursion relation in a way which bakes that in, but um, yeah. is, that, is that it? Um, just because you started by saying we're looking at C greater than one and now we're looking at C less than one plot. So I just want to make Yes, sure because I couldn't find <laughs> a way to apply this to C greater than one, but uh, uh, yeah, so this is a bit, um, okay, the, the thing, I want to say is yes. I mean, you should, strictly speaking, you shouldn't trust this bound. But um, it's it's just like a, okay. I haven't quantified the way in, in the, the the manner in which this bound is to be trusted because of a certain uh, range of positivity that that is just like helpful enough to give you a bound. But maybe there is a way to do it. But I guess there is no interest in it because we already know what minimal models are. Um, that's well, I thought the answer was that that um, you can use the logic cross recursion relation to compute blocks even in minimal models because the residues take care of the decoupling yes. of null states. And so, if that's the function whose coefficients you're plugging in, um, mm -hmm. and you know using to compute your blocks, then that's a robust enough object to. Oh, so then the question becomes, do, do, do minimal models satisfy this pillow crossing relation? Do I understand? So your question yeah. is, you, you plug in, plug in the Virasoro uh, minimal model blocks and see if this is satisfied. And I assume it will be yes. I mean, because the crossing equation is certainly satisfied. The question is, if you're computing with C equals a half, a Virasoro block for delta equals 0.376, some crazy number, Mm -hmm. And there is no unitary representation of the Virasoro algebra with that value of the central charge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what kind of block are you actually computing? It's like not a block in a unitary CFT. There is no such 
block in a unitary CFT with C plus a half. So I can't so tell that you block that. corresponds to some kind of weird representation with C plus a half, but it's not a unitary representation. It presumably has Are negative norms. Are using those blocks? Are we using those blocks? Because we seem to be using just the fact that there are some on the pillow, there are some states exchanged in one cylinder and on the other cylinder, and this is true. Uh, Are these all positive norm states? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you see if T. So if the only thing we are using about. I yeah, think there. Yeah, the where, where, are descendants so, where, where exactly in this formula uh, at this level of generality where we are not using like, anything about positive coefficients, we are just uh, using the fact that there are some positive norm states propagating on the cylinder here and there. And then. I am not sure that all the Virozoa descendants at the generic dimension in the minimal models have positive norm. If you take a dimension that's not. I can't tell you what happened. But we are not especially. using the fact that the Virozoa descendants are positive norm. We are just using that there are some states that there is the lowest state which has positive norm and then everyone else above it who has positive norm enters with the same coefficient in the numerator and denominator, which is true in any theory, basically. And the center of charge enters only in the external, uh, on the external legs. No, that's not correct. It enters also in the in the coefficients of the pure zero blocks. Yeah. Well, not if we use this delta. Uh, it depends on which function you're using. If you're using this delta zero function, which was the simplest one, or I forgot what the name was, q zero, then then not. Yes, exactly. But in plotting these things, I actually use the uh, zamological expressions for the uh, for 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 the coefficients to compute this thing because q four and. Uh, I can tell you what happens like about like in, in some of the things that I tried. For example, if you just like, uh, if you just do like some random thing and uh, in, some, in some of the uh, minimal models, for example, what happens is you don't see, I mean, you start from Q0, you go to Q2 and the bound is not improved. It just oscillates Q0, Q2, Q4, Q6. It just goes back and forth and you see, okay, this is, this is telling me nonsense. And the reason that happens is the coefficients are just not positive definite. And um, it, it so happens in this Ising case, it's just like positive enough in this region that uh, Q4 gives you a better down, bound than Q2, which, gives, which is better than Q0. It should happen when these guys are positive enough. And, uh, but yeah, in some cases, it's just like, goes back and forth in, in C smaller than one, in C greater than one, it never happens. It always gets better, 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 better. So I think people have tried the numerical bootstrap with your zero books, right? Well, I tried it 10 years ago, but never published anything. Has there not been, and then we tried something later and there was some uh, numerical instabilities. This was still with, with machine precision. I'm not sure if people. You, you mean using the plane blocks or like the Q block? The Q block, the full theory zero block. And it's been part of the, the, the this K3 paper, right? Uh, I think there was work in progress here and there. Mm. But fear zero, numerical bootstrap with fear zero. Block. Yeah, there, there, are, there are the papers by Xi's group on K3 and N equals two comma two. Yeah, sure, the Su Susie ones, yeah. And with uh, P uh, with Peter, uh, Xi, and Ying, uh, we, uh, you know, we came up with this uh, uh, bootstrap spectral function uh, to pin down Liouville, and that only used the scalar Virasoro blocks, but it was still Virasoro. I yeah, you also did yeah. Yeah, but yeah, there haven't been there hasn't been that much I think since then uh, in the numerical bootstrap. I see. One needs to pin down a sharp question. Thanks. Well, here, here's a sharp question. We, we know that there is this uh, three pots uh, CFT. We know a little bit about its central charge. We know a little bit about its operator dimensions, but uh, you know, which can be computed independently in some perturbation theory. But maybe there is some island in that space of center charge and operator dimensions, which is you know somewhere above. Uh, I think it's a little bit below two, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 
in which this three pot CFT is actually forced to leave. And then this is a, a question for the numerical bootstrap uh, that numerical bootstrap could answer. But these are coupled pots models, is that correct? Yeah, 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 coupled, possible, coupled with uh, epsilon, epsilon interactions. But actually, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, so this previous work about uh, this previous numerical bootstrap to, into the work, um, yeah, there was this work, but uh, now it looks like you know, with this pillar representation, it looks like the derivatives of this conformal blocks in this pillar representation, they uh, they look uh, like really simple or is there, um, or is this misleading? So the, the, if one was to set up numerical bootstrap in this pillar representation, uh, am I correct by saying that this just looks like extremely simple? It's going to be even easier than uh, the usual numerical bootstrap in the dimensions, or or is it deceptive? I'm I'm a bit confused. I, I don't have experience in usual three-dimensional bootstraps. So. I wouldn't be able to come. So, Paul, when you tried to set it up in key representation, was it uh, was it difficult to you know you, did you have to suffer a lot by going between the fact that Q is a, is a complicated function of Z? No, that was easy. It's a, it's not that complicated. So, going from Q derivatives to Z derivatives, for example, is just trivial. Computation of the numerical blocks. We we found some numerical instabilities that we did not quite understand very well. It seems that our computations of the derivatives of the blocks have converged properly. So we were feeding the solver, the semi-definite program, um, an accurate representation of the blocks as far as we could tell. But the solver itself was not happy. But this was C-plex. So this was still with machine precision. We have much better solvers now. But for example, one thing which I did not appreciate is that the derivatives, there is this, uh, there is this diagonal along which the derivatives are really like trivial, as trivial as in the mistaken derivatives of the exponentials. And, and there's no analog of this in the big-dimensional bootstrap, is there? Would that simplicity be still present if you work in, in the general two-dimensional uh, space of uh, parameters and which the 2.5 depends, or is it something special about the diagonal? I don't, um, I don't know how trivial that is. It might be easier. It might help you in computing these things. I was just using the, the simple zymologic of recursion division. And there you get some complicated Q series with all kinds of factors. I didn't see any simplicity there and I didn't use any simplicity and I don't think it was necessary. Okay. It might it might be simpler. People actually want to like push this. I I suggest we thank Mert again and uh, close here the official talk. <laughs>